In this video, I'm going to talk about the Bohr model and a very special part of the Bohr model, which is angular momentum quantization. This video is part of a playlist on quantum mechanics. You can find the link to this playlist in the description below, or you can click on this. Now let's talk about angular momentum quantization. First of all, let's picture an electron in a Bohr atom. So how does the Bohr model treat an electron? The electron behaves kind of like a planet orbiting the sun, in that it has circular orbits whizzing around the nucleus. So imagine the nucleus is over here, and the electron is uh, orbiting in a circular orbit around over here. It has a fixed velocity, that tangential velocity, and it has a fixed radius, and it also has a fixed energy. So each of, this, of these orbits has fixed values for all of, the, all of those uh, quantities, for radius, for energy, and also for angular momentum, which we'll see in a moment. So another important property is that the electron can behave like a wave. So it has a wavelength. So that's what I'm trying to depict with this little squiggly line over here. So the dotted line, or kind of dashed line, that represents the circular orbit. And this wavy line over here, that represents the standing wave pattern that the electron would create. So what we can do is we can actually generate a condition. We can get a condition from this that relates the radius to the wavelength. First of all, what is the circumference of this circle? Well, the circumference is given by 2 pi r. Let's write that down. So we have 2 pi r. That's the circumference. Now, have a look at the standing wave. Any time you go one revolution around, you have to come back to the same value, right? So if you pick any point over here and you go uh, two pi radians all the way around, you have to come back to the same value. So what does that actually mean? That means the wavelength has to be multiplied by an integer to get the circumference. Or in other words, the circumference is an integer multiple of the wavelength. So let's write that down n is some integer, and lambda is the wavelength. So the circumference, 2 pi r, is an integer multiple of the wavelength. And lambda is the wavelength of the electron. This is the condition that is going to force angular momentum to be quantized. This is why angular momentum cannot take any value. It can only take on a certain number of discrete values. So let's find what those values are. We need to find an expression for a lambda, which is the wavelength. And what do we know uh, from basic quantum mechanics that can tell us this lambda expression? Well, the de Broglie wavelength. That expression, given to us by de Broglie, is going to tell us what the wavelength of the electron is. So let's have a look at that. Lambda is going to be Planck's constant divided by the momentum. So Planck's constant, that's h, and p is the momentum. This over here, this is the de Broglie wavelength. So what de Broglie did was he took the idea of wave-particle duality that was emerging for the description of light, and he applied that to other particles as well. Because if photons, which are little quanta of light, can also be thought of as waves, then why not apply that reasoning to every other particle? That was de Broglie's little intuition and little insight. And it turned out to be correct. All of these small particles actually behave like waves as well. So you can think of any particle as a wave and any wave as a particle. It just depends on the type of experiment that you're doing. That's when you have to consider uh, either one or the other. So how can we write this momentum in a different way? Momentum, we know in, in classical mechanics, momentum is the product of mass and velocity. So let's go ahead and write that over here. So we have h over mv. So this is the mass and this is the velocity. So have a look at this relationship. The wavelength is inversely proportional to mass and the wavelength is also inversely proportional to velocity. So the wavelength is actually going to depend on how massive the particle is. And it's also going to depend on how fast the particle is moving. Because we're considering just electrons whizzing around the nucleus, we don't have to worry about the mass, because the mass is a constant. So Planck's constant, it's in the name, it's going to be constant, and the mass, those guys are all constant. The only thing that's going to be changing is the velocity. So that means that if the velocity is 
larger, so a faster moving electron, uh, is going to have a, a smaller wavelength, right? Because the bigger value down here is going to have a smaller value over here. The opposite is true for slow moving electrons. If the electron is very slow, this value is small, so this is going to be bigger, and the wavelength is going to be bigger. That is a consequence of this inverse proportionality. Now, you can see there's a lambda appearing over here. We have an expression for lambda. And we also have this relationship with lambda. So let's go ahead and substitute this expression for lambda into this little uh, condition that we have from this diagram. I'll do that over here on the other side. So what we can do is we can write the circumference 2 pi r as being equal to n times this expression over here. So we have n times h over mv. But have a look at this. We can do some more rearrangements, and we can move this 2 pi down to this side, or we can move the mv over to this side. And that's going to give us mvr is equal to n times h on 2 pi. So I've just moved the 2 pi, I've divided both sides of the equation by 2 pi, and I've moved this mv over to the other side by multiplying both sides of the equation by mv. So now we have mvr equals n times h over 2 pi. This over here appears very often in quantum mechanics. h over 2 pi is a very common combination. So it's actually given a shorthand symbol, which is h bar. h bar is equal to h over 2 pi. Right? h over 2 pi, you can just think of, when you see this little expression over here, h bar, that's just h over 2 pi. So what we can actually do is we can write this as n times h bar. And we're going to do that in a second. But now let's have a look at what is on the left-hand side of this equation. On the left-hand side, we have mvr. Now, in classical mechanics, this actually corresponds to the angular momentum, which is capital L. Sometimes it's written as lowercase l as well. The angular momentum can be written as n times h bar. So why is this the angular momentum? Well, the angular momentum as a vector quantity, it's actually a, a pseudo vector. It's not, uh, it's not a completely legit vector like velocity or position, but it's close enough, so we'll label it as a vector quantity. It's actually the cross product of r with p. And because in uniform circular motion, all of these guys are perpendicular to one another, we can actually ignore the fact that they're vectors and just consider their magnitudes as scalar quantities. So this p is actually an implicit mv. So what we have is mv times r. That's actually where this expression comes from. The angular momentum is mv times r. So mv is momentum and r is the radius. So this combination is going to keep popping up in Bohr's model. And that is the angular momentum. So the most important uh, thing that we have found in this video is that the angular momentum of an electron in a particular orbit is an integer multiple of h bar. And h bar is Planck's constant over 2 pi. So this fact we're going to use in other videos in this playlist. This is the most important thing uh, that you should take away from this video. Angular momentum is actually quantized. So quantization of angular momentum comes from this condition over here. The circumference of the circle, of this circular orbit, has to be an integer multiple of lambda. So it can be 1, 2, 3, 4 times the wavelength. And however many bumps you have, that's actually going to be related to this integer value. So the takeaway message is angular momentum is quantized because of this condition we get from looking at the wave, uh, a standing wave electron in its little circular orbit.